I never know when it's, whether it's one bang or two bangs, so bear with me if I've banged an incorrect amount of time. Uh, good morning, everyone, or well, good afternoon. I'm Council Member Joe Borelli. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I want to thank the public for attending today's hearing, and I would also like to acknowledge the committee members who are here present. Just uh, Councilman Cabrera and Council Member Amprey Samuel, and we're also joined by Council Member Van Bramer, who has a very, very, very uh, strong interest in the uh, topic of this hearing. Now, regarding today's subject, uh, the committee will examine the impact of new development to Long Island City's emergency services, including both FDNY engine service and FDNY EMS service. As we all know, the department has historically and continues to do so an excellent job at promptly responding to fire and medical emergencies, which helps save countless lives on a daily basis. During today's hearing, we want to make sure that this remains the case, specifically in areas like Long Island City, which have seen a robust increase in development over the past decade. In addition to the rapid increase in residential development, we are looking to see how the addition of Amazon will impact the area uh, with regard to emergency services. An estimated 18,000 new residential units have been constructed in the area since 2006, and there are an additional 10,000 units projected to be open by 2020. Uh, according to the Long Island City Partnership, per perhaps they're biased, but Long Island City is considered the fastest growing neighborhood in the country. That being said, uh, with all of this development and the planned installation of a 25,000 square foot facility that will usher in uh, thousands of people, Long Island City needs to reopen Engine 261. As I stated last month during a press conference in front of uh, existing ladder company 116, uh, which lacks the equipment to put water on a fire, uh, it is imperative that Engine 261 be reactivated in order to support the explosive growth in population and commercial activity in the community. So today we look forward to addressing the real need for potential new emergency services and discuss, among other issues, the fire department's general preparation for increased population in LIC, uh, how the building industry can assist or collaborate with the department to provide New Yorkers with better emergency services, and if the FDNY plans to reevaluate the need for a firehouse EMS station uh, in, uh, to be added in the area. I would now like to ask those members of the administration who plan to testify to please state your name for the record and to raise your right hand as the committee council administers the oath. Oh, I'm sorry. First, we're going to hear from uh, Council Member Van Bramer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First, let me just say thank you to Chair Borelli for uh, taking such an interest in this particular uh, issue that obviously has local consequences for us, but citywide implications for all of New York City, because when you cut back on fire protection services and FDNY operations, you make no one safer. And it was never a good idea to close Engine Company 261. It's an even worse idea today. And uh, let me just say, as I said at the press conference, it's never a good idea uh, to close firehouses, engine companies. And we have learned that the decision made by Mayor Bloomberg in 2003 uh, was short-sighted. Obviously, Long Island City has grown exponentially since then, therefore making it clear to everyone that more and more people need the fire department more and more people are in danger of the fire department not being able to do their heroic work, uh, not because they aren't rushing to the scene or aren't risking their lives, but because by closing that engine company, both of those things have been made even harder. So with Amazon coming, and whether or not those 25 or 40,000 people live in Long Island City, uh, or work in Long Island City, it obviously will require uh, the FDNY to respond to even more emergencies. And every day that we allow Engine Company 261 to remain closed remains another day that we welcome tragedy uh, because we know the need exists. We know how the local community feels. And I want to uh, recognize and thank all the members of the FDNY and all of the uh, various uh, unions that represent uh, the men and women of the FDNY. I also want to 
uh, make sure that everyone knows that the Dutch Kill Civic Association, our local civic association in the neighborhood, has been fighting this fight for a long time. Uh, but as many of you heard me say at the press conference, uh, Tony Benetados, who is an active duty firefighter with the FDNY, uh, was sworn in as the president of the Dutch Kill Civic Association just in December. Uh, and the fire on Queens Boulevard that destroyed several businesses uh, was a poignant reminder to everyone in Western Queens uh, just how important our firefighters are, just how dangerous their job is. And Tony uh, Benetados was one of those who responded to that fire and was working on that fire uh, all night and uh, risked his life, as did all of those firefighters. So uh, the question isn't should Engine Company 261 be open. Uh, the question is how soon can the de Blasio administration open it? And what else can be done to increase safety in and around Western Queens? Uh, we know what's happened in terms of growth, uh, and we know uh, what we need. And with Amazon coming, uh, uh, should it come, uh, we know that those needs have just increased exponentially further. So I want to thank, again, Chair Borelli for his leadership. Uh, and we rallied several times uh, over the last several years uh, since I've been the council member. And uh, uh, the community has never forgotten uh, the mistake made by the Bloomberg administration 15 years ago to close this. We will never stop fighting until it reopens. Uh, with that, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And now we'll ask the members of the administration to uh, state their name for the oath. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Please state your name before speaking. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Borelli, Council Member Van Bramer, and all the Council Members present. My name is John Sudnick, and I am the Acting Chief of Department for the New York City Fire Department. I am joined today by Alvin Suriel, Deputy Assistant Chief for EMS Operations, Christine Mazzola, EMS Division Chief, John Benanti, Deputy Commissioner of Support Services, and Joe Mastropietro, Assistant Commissioner for Facilities. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the impact of new development on emergency services in Long Island City. Before I address that topic, I would like, a like to take a moment to acknowledge a profound loss suffered by uh, last week by our department and the city of New York. Firefighter Stephen H. Pollard died from critical injuries sustained while operating at a motor vehicle accident on the Mill Basin Bridge in Brooklyn. Firefighter Pollard had a year and a half on the job at the time of his death. As his family mourns him, the department and the citizens of this city mourn him as well. I want to express my appreciation to Council Member Maisel for attending the wake and to Chair Borelli and Speaker Johnson for attending the funeral. Thank you both very much. Long Island City is an area of Queens that has experienced significant growth in recent years. According to the Economic Development Corporation, more than 8,100 housing units uh, were completed within Long Island City between January 2008 and November 2018, and there are currently nearly 10,000 housing units under construction. With the recent announcement that Amazon will be locating their second headquarters in Long Island City, there is certain to be additional growth, both residential and commercial. This is also a location where an engine company, Engine 261, was closed in 2003 under the Bloomberg administration. In all areas of the city, the fire department remains vigilant to ensure that we are able to maintain sufficient capacity to respond to emergencies. We pay careful attention to neighborhoods experiencing rapid changes in population and building density and type. We work closely with agencies such as the Department of City Planning and the Economic Development Corporation to learn as much as we can about new growth and evaluate whether we need to add existing resources to serve the surrounding population. 
The department conducts constant monitoring of resources across the city on a daily basis. However, in light of rapid growth in Long Island City, we have studied the area more comprehensively to assess the need for additional resources in the neighborhood and surrounding areas. Given what we know about the changing nature of the area, we were already in the process of considering whether additional resources were necessary due to the recent growth of the area when Amazon made their announcement. Among the data that we consider is, is the growing number of responses performed by the fire companies in the area and the response times to those incidents. Another factor in this assessment is that the companies located in Long Island City also serve Ro Roosevelt Island. When there is an emergency incident on Roosevelt Island and an incident in Long Island City, companies have to respond from further away. In Long Island City, we have seen an increase in the number of incidents and in response times to those incidents. In particular, in Queens Community Board 1, calls for all incident types increased 19 percent between 2014 and 2018, and resto uh, response times to all calls were up 9 percent. Our level of need for additional resources in Queens Community Board 1 is among the highest level for any area in the city, and it's the highest level of need for any location in the borough of Queens. We also study factors across the city to continuously determine whether there is a need for additional EMS resources. The Long Island City neighborhood has seen an increase in incidents in recent years. To address this growing need, in 2018, we added an additional basic life support unit to, the, to service the area. We also added uh, tactical response group units to Queens, and we have used the flexibility of the TRG program, which began in 2017, to position units in the Long Island City neighborhood when call volume required it. We can anticipate with confidence that the growth in daytime population brought on by Amazon will lead to a greater number of incidents. Our understanding is that Amazon will initially create 25,000 jobs over 10 years, with a plan to grow to 40,000 over 15 years. So we will continue monitoring the growth of incidents and response times to ensure that we are devoting adequate resources to that area. Our existing need for resources in Long Island City will be expanded by the rapid growth that the area will experience when Amazon arrives. We anticipate a significant increase in commercial office space, initially with Amazon itself, and subsequently due to peripheral development. Amazon may also serve as a catalyst for further growth in residential units in Long Island City. We will continue updating our analysis of the need for additional resources to take into account the additional growth that the neighborhood and surrounding area will see as a result of Amazon. At this time, however, we don't yet have enough details about the Amazon development to precisely factor it in to an updated analysis and make accurate projections. We expect to do that once we are able to determine projected square footage and occupancy type of the new developments, projected daytime population growth and evening population growth, and perhaps attain an insight into the peripheral development anticipated by DCP and EDC. That information remains unknown at this time, but we will work with our partners across city government as it becomes available so that we are able to conduct an analysis of our growing needs with the most accurate and up-to-date information. Put simply, Long Island City is a neighborhood to which we were already considering adding resources due to the growing emergency response needs of the area. The development spurred by Amazon will only add to those needs, and we will refine our analysis and adjust our resources accordingly as we learn more about it. The fire department is dedicated to maintaining a network of capabilities that enable us to provide the best possible service to the people of New York. We monitor and evaluate daily and long-term performance metrics, including incident responses and type, resource deployment, res uh, response times, and overall effectiveness in our response and handling of emergencies across the city. If the results of our analysis of Long Island City show that we need additional fire and EMS assets, we provide the resources necessary to maintain the elite level of service that the people we serve have come to expect. We'd be happy to take your questions at this time. Uh, thank you, Chief. I certainly uh, appreciate your being here today, as with uh, the rest of your colleagues. Uh, just a, a quick question uh, to kick us off. You said that you're, uh, you, you, don't, you can't adequately predict uh, the type of development that Amazon may bring. Um, are you aware of the term tech bro? Tech bro. 
I'll read it to you. It is an urban dictionary term. It's a guy who works in the tech field, often but not always lacking in social skills, sometimes focused on a career to the exclusion of female companions. It's a term for the people who kind of work at Amazon and Google uh, and these sort of things. Uh, the reason why I'm asking is just as a, as a baseline, is there any reason we should uh, expect that people who work in, in, in one of the 25,000 new Amazon jobs, that they would not be experiencing uh, any type of health emergencies that 25,000 other random New Yorkers won't? Uh, so are you, you're saying is there any reason why they would not experience the same right. needs? Okay, good. I mean, they have some crazy stuff at Amazon. You know, I wasn't sure what they were developing, maybe bionic arms or something like that. But uh, uh, anyway, that was my tech bro joke, everyone. Okay. Didn't go over well. <clears throat> so just let's start with a broad, uh, a broad scope. When the department recognizes a need for more resources, what, what are the t uh, steps you, you take? Uh, you mentioned that you studied uh, LIC. So what are the steps in general that the department takes? Well, uh, obviously we'll have these conversations internally and uh, we'll take a look at the broad spectrum of our resource needs um, across the entire city. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll make a determination on uh, what our objectives are and if we're meeting our objectives uh, with the resources we currently have. Um, as you know, recently uh, we opened up a squad company in Staten Island. Uh, I believe that's uh, where you call home. And uh, that's one of the areas that we uh, made a determination where we had that need. And uh, thanks to the efforts of, of um, the city council and the administration, we were able to fulfill that need. Is there a formal process uh, the department goes through to evaluate the, the shifting needs? Is there, a, is there an acronym for it, or is it something you, you regularly do? Well, we've done studies. We also have a, a working group that we have that uh, takes a look at um, uh, growth in the city, upzoning, if you will, and um, they meet periodically uh, every couple weeks, and um, they uh, take a look at the data that we have uh, that's provided from our, our uh, internal group of analysis and planning, and, uh, and they uh, have those conversations and, and they, they take a look to see which areas are considered uh, in most need, if you will, uh, going forward. Thank you. Uh, we, to note, we've been joined by Council Member Brannon of Brooklyn. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, and uh, Council Member Maisel, also of Brooklyn. Nice of you to join us. Good question. It's good. Um, as a rule of thumb, does the department see uh, an increase in uh, tours, uh, both in fire uh, and ambulance tours, in areas where there has been a substantial population increase? Well, it's, it's, it's not a, from the fire perspective, it's, it's not as a rule of thumb. Um, you know, we'll, we'll um, if we have, uh, uh, we move assets around on, on the fire operations side, move resources around based on activity, and most of that is done, um, for example, if there's a fire in the area and there's a depletion of resources, we'll immediately move or relocate units into that area. Um, I'll defer to EMS uh, on, on the EMS resources, but I know that they have these tactical uh, response groups that I mentioned before, uh, both in Queens and in the Bronx, and uh, they uh, identify needs uh, that occurred during a tour, and they'll reassign um, those resources as they see fit. Uh, that is correct. So we continuously monitor the, um, the jobs coming in, and if we have to move units, we'll move the uh, Bronx tactical uh, response group as well as the Queen's tactical response groups. Is there an established standard or an established goal uh, regarding a ratio between residential population of an area uh, to an engine company or to an EMS ambulance tour? Is it like, you know, do you, do you want one ambulance for every 10,000 people in an area or is? Uh, for the EMS side, no. Uh, we don't have that on the fire side either. There's not a uh, established ratio. Okay. So uh, prior to Squad 8, uh, what were the uh, previous last few uh, engine companies that were opened in the city? Do you know? 
It's probably been a while. We did open up uh, units in Staten Island and Tottenville. Um, we opened up... Uh, 168, uh, we, I think, right? Yeah. Um, we opened up uh, in Queens before that. Before that, we opened up a ladder company in Jamaica, Queens. I mean, do you, do you recall, what, uh, or anyone on the panel, do you recall some of the, the reasons that went into opening these companies? Uh, I believe I was so long ago, I believe I was either a firefighter or a lieutenant at the time of, uh, of the opening of uh, Ladder 133 in Queens, and um, that was part of the previous administration. So I don't have the specifics as to the, um, the criteria that they used. For the, for the EMS stations, I know uh, we uh, opened up the Queens TRG to assist with that, so that, that's what we did in Queens. And we're also in the process, I don't know, John or Joe, uh, of trying to open a new station, Station 49 as well, in that community. W where is that? That's out in the story. It's actually not opening a new one. There's a station that exists right now under the Triborough Bridge. We're looking and we found a better location and we're having DCAS negotiate for that better location. But that, that's as a result of, of a real estate need, not necessarily as a result of an increase in population or uh, responses. I'm sorry. I, that, that's, as a, that, that's addressing a real estate need, not necessarily an increase in population or of uh, responses. Right. Well, I think the station we're looking to build is going to be a bigger station so they can put more units there if they need to. Um, What is the uh, response time? Uh, so, so Queens, uh, as we know, has a, a slightly longer response time uh, for an engine company than, say, Brooklyn. Um, what is the uh, response? Well, first of all, what, what battalion would uh, Engine 261 be in? It would be a 4-5 battalion. Is the 4-5 battalion, on average, uh, have a slower response time or a faster response time than the citywide average? Do we know? I don't have that, but um, they're all within acceptable uh, response times. Uh, that's what's considered acceptable according to NFPA standards. But slower, but faster is always better. I mean, none, right? I mean, that's. I will not disagree with you. Faster is always better. Um, and the response time that we found for uh, for Queens, I think, was four minutes and fifty seconds, or something right around there. It was four minutes, 43 seconds. That's almost a minute slower uh, than Brooklyn. When the FDNY calculates response time, when does the clock begin? Well, it, it's going to get quite complicated, but, you know, certainly, um, you know, we, we just changed the, the metric on how we calculate our response times to include, um, uh, to, to include processing time. Uh, you may or may not know that we've we changed the parameters from uh, how we receive calls from 911 now. Um, so I, I don't want to complicate the matters there, but generally speaking, um, I guess taking a look at um, the way our companies, uh, once they receive a call uh, to the time they get and um, you know, receive the call at the firehouse to the time that they arrive at the location, that's called travel time. And if we compare the travel, that comparing travel time um, from say one company or one area to the next would be a pretty accurate way to take a look at it. So uh, what about the time it takes uh, to, to when you stop at the front door of a building, uh, if the building is two stories or three stories, is there a shorter time uh, to put water on a fire than say if the building is uh, 15, 20, 30 stories? Well, clearly it would take longer to apply water to a fire to a 15 story uh, building than it would to a two story building. Um, once you arrive at the front of the building, correct. So the, the, the vertical response time is something that, that uh, you know, captains of, of, of the company uh, and people on the ground would have to factor into the decisions they make. Well, they're, they're going to operate at uh, the way they operate given our current procedures for the type of building that they operate at. Um, High-rise buildings have elevators. Um, they use, utilize the elevators to get to uh, the areas of fire for tactical operations, um, so they utilize those. Um, you know, the two-story buildings, um, you know, are generally uh, performed with uh, hand stretches from uh, engine company from the street. So rule of thumb, though, um, it, it would take longer for uh, water to be put on a fire in a high-rise as opposed to a, a warehouse. 
assuming there, there wasn't any special conditions? Uh, you know, it, it, there's, um, it's, it's hard to answer that question because, you know, obviously the higher you go in, into a building, it's going to, you know, uh, the, the, the more time it's going to take. So why don't we, for example, take a high-rise residential building. So theoretically a fire on the 10th floor of a, of a 60 story building, um, we, we would get to quicker, you know, than we would for a fire on the 50th floor. Um, with the use of elevators, you know, that time is certainly reduced. Um, a warehouse could have its own uh, complicating factors. Um, so so we, don't, we don't necessarily compare, you know, our operations from or our operating time from one specific building to another. Um, we do have our tactics that we perform for each particular building uh, that we have established for, um, uh, for centuries. So, you know, so. But just from the, 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 you know, the, the real operating time, I mean, not, not based on the FDNY's metrics, but the actual time it would take to get uh, from uh, the firehouse to uh, the 30th story of a building, um, do you foresee it being longer when Long Island City continues to be rezoned uh, and higher and, and higher density buildings are built? Yeah, uh, certainly that's, um, you know, that would be a reason why we would, uh, we could utilize additional resources in areas where they're building high rise buildings. Uh, if you take a look at uh, fire protection in the borough of Manhattan, uh, the firehouses, the fire units are closer together and that takes uh, all that, uh, I think the terminology used is the, the vertical response time, so it would take that into consideration. What, was that the reason why uh, 261 was closed down, uh, or was it a, a result of just a... a Again, kind of, with, with all due respect, uh, you know, in 2003, I wasn't in the position to make the, the determination on when uh, 261 was closed. I would love to know Captain Sudnick's uh, opinions around the kitchen table when uh, 261 closed. <laughs> Uh, he, he worked in East New York, Brooklyn at the time. Okay. Um, there was a statistic I saw uh, in your testimony. Oh, I'm reading the wrong page. So responses, response times to all calls citywide were up 9%. Is that, is that response times to all types of calls? Okay, so that, that, was, um, that was for Queens, and, and that, took into consideration the, um, that took into consideration the new metric that we used, uh, including the processing time, or what we call end-to-end -end time. Okay, but that, that's for uh, EMS, fires, every type of response? No, that was, that's for f fire units responding to those calls okay. from, uh, I believe, 2014 to 2018. So then it's safe yeah. to say. Oh, yeah, and that's uh, for, for that community board. Community board. Right, community board one was 19%. Then you said Queens was 9%. Yeah, com community board one in Queens was 9%. So that means that just the, the incident types increased uh, and the response times almost doubled the amount in community board one than elsewhere in Queens? Or am I reading that wrong? No, it's uh, the, the number of calls increased 19% during that period of time. Oh, and I'm sorry, and the response time was up 9%. Okay. Right, calls. Incidents is 19, yep. response time. If a Queens Community Board response uh, or calls increased by 19% uh, over the last four years, uh, what has the, the borough of Queen, uh, Queens seen an increase in? Is it also 19% or is Community Board 1 outpacing the increases in Queens? I don't have that information now, but I know that Community Board uh, analysis that we did, did previously um, showed that um, Community board, board 1 outpaced all other community boards in Queens. So it's, it, the, the fact that you, you have it, as you said, uh, on the radar of the department is, is really a result of all these factors, the population and the response times and the number of calls, correct? Yeah, that's correct, among other things, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, what, what other things? Well, we take a look at um, several workload, obviously, which is call volume. Uh, we, we define that as impact. We look at the performance, which includes response times, uh, unit availability, plus uh, which includes first and second due units. We take a look at the population itself, the at-risk population, which would include 
uh, take into uh, demographic factors such as age, socioeconomic factors. Uh, so we, we do a quite extensive uh, analysis and uh, include as many factors as we can uh, so as to get a complete picture of what's going on in a particular area. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Council Member Van Bramer. Thank you very much again, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, for taking this on, and thank you very much for uh, your testimony. So um, a couple of, of thoughts and then a, a couple of questions. Um, you know, I feel like uh, even your testimony is, is uh, uh, moving us uh, towards what I hope will be the inevitable uh, reopening of Engine Company 261. Uh, and this is not directed at anyone at this table, but really at the administration. Um, it just shouldn't have taken Amazon coming here uh, to make this happen. Um, uh, and, and, and I think this should have been done years ago. Um, and just a few thoughts about your testimony. And uh, you mentioned that uh, according to EDC, 8,100 new housing units completed uh, since January of 08, with 10,000 more under construction. Uh, but between 2003, when the engine company was closed, and 2008, there were additional units that were added in Western Queens as well. So I guess I would say if 20,000 new uh, units of housing uh, uh, come online, is that, is that not an argument for not only increasing these kinds of life-saving services, but certainly an argument against reducing them. Well, I, I would certainly advocate for not reducing them. Uh, again, I, I'll leave it up to uh, uh, the administration to make that determination on whether that they need to increase the, um, the resources that the fire department needs. Well, I understand your, your respect for the, the chain of command, but uh, I think it's uh, appalling that the administration has not already made that determination um, and given you all the resources that you need uh, to save lives. Another part of your testimony, uh, as the chair referenced in Queens Community Board 1, I would just like to point out, and I think you all know this too, that a big portion of Long Island City, of course, is in Community Board two, right? So uh, all of your stats are, are CB1 relevant, but a lot of the towers are actually in CB2. So some of those uh, uh, factors need to be considered here. Um, but just in CB1 alone, uh, call, uh, calls increased 19 percent, the response times up 9 percent. Is that also not a screaming argument for reopening Engine Company 261? Well, uh, certainly um, I'm glad that we're sitting here having the conversation about opening uh, another company, as opposed to closing companies like they were in 2003. Uh, amen to that, but, um, and again, we didn't just have the press conference, and again, this is not directed at anyone sitting at this table, um, on December 1st with the Congresswoman, but uh, I had uh, rallies and protests with a lot of the folks uh, uh, here and their predecessors over the years, um, and we had years to get this right, um, but now that Amazon has been announced, um, you, you would almost, you, you almost couldn't see this engine company not being reopened. Um, and it just shouldn't come to that. Uh, politics really doesn't have a role to play when we're talking about saving lives, and again, that's not directed at anyone at that table. So you also mentioned that there's more uh, uh, crunching of the data, there are internal discussions going on. I guess I would just ask, what more do you need to see in order to come to that, what I believe is rightful and inevitable conclusion, that engine company 261 is reopening. What, what, what are you missing in order to say, damn it, we got to reopen this thing, lives are at risk here, should have been done years ago? Again, I think from our perspective, um, if we're presented with the additional resource and um, of another engine company in the area, 
uh, at the area would certainly benefit from it. So I, I obviously won't put words in your mouth, and again, I, I respect uh, uh, you all and, and to some degree the position you're in, but as is the case with many things in the city of New York, this is about political will, and as you mentioned, resources. And so it is incumbent upon the mayor uh, who cut the Amazon deal uh, to make sure that the resources are provided to the fire department, the FDNY, uh, to be in a position to save lives of people in Long Island City, including the tech bros that uh, Council Member Riley educated all of us on a little bit earlier. So um, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, say thank you for uh, your service. Um, and I believe, again, without um, uh, putting words in any of, of your mouths, that um, uh, from uh, Commissioner Nigro uh, uh, down to all of you, um, I would just assume that if the resources were provided, that all of you would very much want Engine Company 261 to be reopened so that uh, the hardworking men and women of the FDNY can do their jobs and do their jobs right. So with that, I'll just say thank you. Uh, thank you. Next, I'll have uh, Council Member Cabrera. Thank you so much uh, to the Chair and to my colleague, uh, uh, Jimmy Bam Framer uh, for bringing up this issue. I'm, to be honest with you, I'm kind of scratching my middle right now, scratching my head, because uh, you actually presented a really good case if I was uh, coming here, or if you were coming here as a council member. As a matter of fact, the data that you brought uh, was the data that I was, you know, everyone would love to present uh, where you have uh, the fastest growing neighborhood in all the United States. You have, as it was mentioned, the 19% increase in, in, in types, 9% 9, 9 res, uh, up in response time. I, I, and so if I get this right, is it the funding? Is, is that what I hear you saying? And that the administration hasn't committed to the funding uh, in order to restore? I, I just want it on the record, what, what's the problem? What's, what's holding? Oh, it's uh, my belief that the conversations are happening uh, at this present time uh, with OMB and uh, the folks at, uh, in the mayor's office uh, regarding the funding. I, I'm a little surprised that it's taking this long in light of the fact that it, when the discussions took place with Amazon, and I know this, this, this goes to the administration, but when the discussions uh, were taking place with Amazon and the millions and billions of dollars that were committed, that that didn't take place at that stage. Uh, have you heard uh, if there were any discussions that took place during that time uh, regarding you know, having a situation, because all the criteria has been made. I mean, this is like a no-brainer. Uh, all the criteria has been made. Has, were there any discussions? Were there, uh, from the commissioner, was there any communications that went to the mayor's office back then regarding the need for this? Or this happened after the fact, after the agreement that took place? Uh, we were not part of any discussions uh, in regard to uh, Amazon uh, uh, previously. Um, I was told that um, Amazon has reached out and, and, um, to, and will work with the uh, Department of City Planning uh, to set up meetings with uh, various city agencies, FDNY included. So um, we look forward to, to meeting with them uh, when, when that becomes available. What, what uh, in terms of funding, what, what will be the associated costs with maintaining and staffing uh, this engine company? I believe initially, uh, in the first year, it's uh, roughly, uh, initial cost is about $4 million. So it's really a drop in the bucket, really, that we're talking about here, right? It's not a whole lot of money. I'm a fire chief, I'm not a budget. <laughs> I wish the commissioner respect, was sir. here so we could ask him these questions. Uh, cause, uh, but I hear you, I, I don't wanna put you on the spot. Uh, uh, but I had to bring it forth so it would be communicated to the commissioner and to the administration. 
uh, but it's $4 million. I mean, serious, this is not a whole lot. Is there any capital improvement that is needed on the building, or was it, it's been maintained? There is some capital work that has to be done. Commissioner Benanti could uh, talk you through the, that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it, actually it's expense dollars. It wouldn't really be capital dollars. Um, we did take a look at the, my architects had gone and taken a look at the building to see what it would cost to bring it up. Um, we would have to do some bathroom work, some split the bunker room, office, officers' quarters would have to be done. Um, we have a guesstimate of about $1.2 million on the facility side as far as bringing it up to speed. Hey, can I just interrupt you one second? Sure, sure. Are you doing the bathrooms at every firehouse? Excuse me? Are you going to redo the bathrooms at every firehouse? We have redone bathrooms at all firehouses. All was this firehouse done already? The bathroom was done prior, but it was done as a single company at the time. It was not done as a double, so there's not enough showers, not enough urinals for a double company. And the same thing for the officer. Okay, can I just ask the question then? This was a, a house that housed uh, two companies. Then it was closed, and somebody made the decision to retrofit it, but sort of downside and not perhaps think that one day the company would have to open again? I'm going to say it, was, it wasn't you guys, but... Somebody made a, hopefully it wasn't you guys. I had asked the same question, but it came back as budget. Um, Mr. Chair, can I come back uh, with a second question, second round? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Chair, if I, could, if I may, we just want to say the, the $4 million figure, I think there's more in there. Um, we'd have to get more specifics on that. In the past, when the, the department has reopened uh, a firehouse, has that changed the, the hiring uh, numbers of the FDNY? It would increase the budgeted headcount, I believe. Um, but would it, would it, so it would increase the budgeted headcount, but would it increase the actual headcount, or would you more than likely uh, pull people from other companies for a while? Well, right now, I could tell you that we're over budgeted headcount in the FDNY, so um, regarding how we would staff uh, that unit or a new any new unit going forward is something that we'd have to take a look at carefully to make sure that, you know, we had the right uh, level of, ex uh, of experience and, um, uh, and things like that in the company. Is, uh, is Ladder Company 116 considered a, a busy house or a, a slower house? That's a pretty broad um, uh, well, in, question, in terms but, of, uh, you know, comparatively possibly. to, um, you know, I, I would consider it uh, to be uh, as far as uh, probably on average, about average uh, in, in activity compared to other ladder companies in the city. Um, so we pulled the data from the, the census tracts that make up uh, – downtown Long Island City and uh, some of the immediate surroundings. Um, some of the census tracts have a population increase of 493%, one of them does. Uh, others are about 200%. But the average for the uh, seven census tracts that makes up Long Island City is uh, 200%, so doubling the population growth. Is there any other area of the city uh, that you know of or that, that has been on the radar for the department that has seen that uh, sudden? of a population growth over 10 years? I don't have that information right now, but um, certainly there are areas that uh, we've noticed um, or we've seen um, growth in population or repopulation, if you will. Um, but I don't have the specifics uh, on the statistics that you're referring to. So I'll ask it a different way then. What other neighborhoods of New York City is the working group uh, looking at for adding services or amending services? When we complete our methodology and our criteria, which is some of the criteria that the chief was talking about, we plan on doing a citywide assessment of it. In the meantime, we do meet with city planning, and we've gone over and they've come up with a couple of uh, areas that, you know, that they said that we can look at, but for the most part, we're waiting until we get our criteria squared away so we can do our methodologies and do a citywide review and assessment. Uh, one final question, then I'll, I'll give it to uh, Councilmember Van Bramer. Should this be in the mayor's executive budget proposal this year? The, 
the, uh, the additional uh, company. Should it be? And, and additional ambulance tours as well. Well, again, I think uh, the fact that it's already being discussed um, between OMB and City and City Hall, I, I think that the conversation is happening. Um, and again, I, you know, I, I will, uh, the fact that we're not talking about closing companies, right. like right. they were in 2003, um, uh, I think uh, we're, we're going in the right direction, Council. So when the, when the commissioner comes back uh, in a, a couple of months uh, and we're talking about the, the budget needs for uh, FY20, do you suspect that, that this will be uh, on the list? Or if not, you know, w what else should we uh, expect to see? I, I expect it's going to be part of the conversation. Okay, great. Uh, Councilmember Van Bramer. Thanks. Just a quick follow-up on two things. Uh, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, when I asked what more do you need in terms of metrics and data to make this final decision? Um, uh, you, you basically said, you know, we need to hear from the administration and, and, and OMB. So just to put a finer point on it, do you think from that strictly from a fire protection services FDNY angle, the question's already been answered in terms of whether or not we need Engine Company 261 open and that it's just simply the only question really that's remaining here is whether or not you're going to get the additional money from OMB. Uh, I don't know if I can answer that. What I can say is that um, given additional resources in that area, it will certainly improve our performance uh, from a fire protection standpoint uh, in those two community boards. Right. So I want to be respectful of you, but um, uh, as uh, uh, the person you are and the rank that you hold within this organization, um, are you able to say whether or not you believe the question's been answered strictly from a service and safety perspective? Uh, I, I think I know what you're trying to say. I'm, again, going to, I think the, da the data uh, is, uh, is favorable for certainly taking a close look at additional resources in the area. And I think that's what we're doing. Um, so, and I think that's the reason why we're here. So I'm confident that uh, the conversations are happening at the right levels. Uh, I am too now, uh, but I'll just reiterate again, this is not directed to you. It, shouldn't take uh, um, Amazon uh, to have uh, spurred this on. Speaking of Amazon, you mentioned one other thing is my final question, that Amazon is now meeting with city planning and other city agencies, which is great that a lot of folks from Seattle have uh, uh, helicoptered in to, uh, to meet with some of our agencies. But city planning <laughs> should always be meeting with city agencies, including the FTNY, to figure out what the people need who are in these neighborhoods. Uh, it's great that Amazon is on a fact-finding mission. They may spread uh, some philanthropy around, but that's, that's not a substitute for good city planning. And a good responsive city planning department would have seen this growth and would have already gone to OMB in the mayor's office um, to say, by God, this FDNY engine company needs to reopen because of all these extra people that have come and or are scheduled to come. So um, maybe that's a little editorial. You don't have to respond to that. But um, uh, this is this was a mistake when it happened in 03. It's been a mistake every day. Uh, and uh, it, it should not have come to this and been this long. Amazon is not a good cover for finally reopening an engine company. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, sometimes I meet with city planning and I, I can't figure out what they're saying either. So I, I, don't, I don't blame you guys for that. Don't. Uh, Council Member Cabrera. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, who, someone mentioned that Station 49 is a new station. Who, who was it? So, like you said, it's not a new station. We're just looking for new property. Correct. Okay, so it's not a new station. I just 
just but move. Point of clarification. It's an expansion. It's just expansion. Hopefully, we can get more units in there as well. Because it's area. bursting in the scenes in terms of people working there, right? All the I, staff. I will, uh, so it's not, I just want to make sure, time. because the question, the discussion was regarding new station, and I don't want station 49 to be portrayed as a new one. Correct. It's it is not. Is not a new one. 49 exists currently under the tri-borough, but uh, the borough chief of Queens, uh, Chris, can answer that for you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like Chief Serial mentioned, it's not a new facility. Uh, we have many members that are working in that facility. We have many units that, that turn out of that facility and cover Community Board 1 and 2. Uh, the idea with um, the uh, brick and mortar versus where they are today uh, and being able to is a larger area uh, that, we're, that the department is trying to, to solidify so we would have room for expansion in that particular area knowing that we have additional a call volume and and the numbers as as they are and have been discussed today okay so that's it that's currently in the process i appreciate that answer because i i what i don't want it to be seen that we're getting more stations than we actually have no which is it, all it you're is correct it's just a bigger building yeah with 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 room for expansion uh okay. where they are at the moment they don't have that room for expansion gotcha thank you so much thank you so much mr chair Uh, thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So the next panel will be uh, Vincent Variali, Gerard Fitzgerald, Michael Greco, Oren Barzali, and George Farinacci. And if anybody else would uh, would like to testify, they can come up uh, and uh, fill out a card. And I want to point out that uh, Assemblywoman Kathy Nolan has also submitted testimony to the committee. Who would like to begin? Anyone? Gerard, you seem ready, please. Thanks. Good morning, or good afternoon. Uh, just before I start, I would like to echo uh, Chief Sudnick's uh, thoughts about uh, firefighter St Stephen Pollard, who was lost to us last week. I want to thank uh, Council Member Joe Borelli for attending the funeral, uh, Council Member Alan Mizell for being at the, uh, the wake, and uh, to speak of Corey Johnson and, and the mayor for uh, being at the funeral also. Uh, thank you for remembering Stephen Pollard. Uh, please continue to do so. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Gerard Fitzgerald. I am the president of the Uniform Firefighters Association of Greater New York. I want to thank you all for allowing me to, the opportunity to join the members of this community and give testimony today in front of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. As president of the UFA, I represent the health and safety and interests of more than 85 New York, 8,500 New York City firefighters and the citizens they keep out of harm's way. And as such, it is my duty to bring attention to a critical fire safety issue developing in Long Island City. 15 years ago, the city closed a long-standing firehouse in Long Island City, Engine, Com Engine Company 261, due to, due to Bloomberg era budget cuts. Ladder Company 116 is now the only company in that area. Closing Engine 261 was a mistake from the get-go. The area has been short of fire protection since 2003. And in 2019, Long Island City is now the fastest growing community in the nation, with thousands of new workers and residents coming to the area. This huge change in population requires upgrades to infrastructure and fire safety measures. 
On top of this, Amazon now plans to build one of its new campuses in Long Island City, creating 25,000 jo 25, jobs and a 600-seat intermediate school in the neighborhood. It is abundantly clear that Long Island City now lacks the resources to deal with fire safety issues effectively. Reopening Engine 261 not only serves to address immediate needs in Long Island City, but also to expand capacity to protect Roosevelt Island. At present, without an engine company in the area, Ladder 116 lacks the equipment and personnel to fight fires adequately and relies on engine companies traveling from a greater distance. Increased population growth and added congestion due in part to lane additions like extended bike lanes, bus lanes, and traffic islands has already increased response times in the area, putting lives at stake. Furthermore, the FDMY has broken its run record for five consecutive years. We are, down, we are now doing more than ever before with the same number or amount of resources. 2018 was our busiest year on record. We ran 32,000 more runs than we did the previous year, and 140,150 more runs than we did in 2013. Availability is at an all-time low. With Amazon coming, we cannot wait any longer. Long Island City must be given, a su given suitable infrastructure and safety precautions designed to match its future growth. Reopening Engine 261 should not be a major task. The facility already exists, and just to uh, expand on that, it now has the same amount of bathrooms and showers that it had before. And the need is highly apparent. We only require the resources to supply equipment and manpower. For the continued safety of the residents of Long Island City, we urge the members of this committee, which I don't think is necessary, as well as the mayor and elected officials across the city to call for the reinstatement of Engine 261 at its former location. Bringing back 261 will ensure that Long Island City has the necessary equipment and personnel to fight fires adequately and can respond in a timely fashion to any safety needs that arise. I would, also, I would also like to add, with the rapid growth and developments across the city, not just Long Island City, but also Hudson Yards, Harlem, downtown Brooklyn, and soon to come, South Bronx, we cannot let these situations like these become the norm. As new neighborhoods and developments arise across the city, we must make sure that New Yorkers' safety's needs don't continue to get overlooked. We must plan responsibly. Lives are in danger. There is no, no more time to waste on this. Thank you again for your time today, and I am happy to address any questions you may have. Great, thank you. We'll probably save uh, any questions for the end uh, if we want to just continue down the line with uh, the, the, the well-appointed George Farinacci. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, just a, a moment, if I may, on behalf of uh, Firefighter Stephen Pollard, thank you to the great people of the city and the council uh, sincerely for all your efforts and support. Uh, very meaningful. Uh, just. Uh, uh, something to take note of, uh, Firefighter Pollard uh, passed uh, while responding to an emergency. Uh, there was no um, spectacular flames coming out of a window or, or tremendous heights. Uh, it just uh, is an example of our day-to-day -day job that we sometimes take for granted. It is dangerous operating in the city of New York to an unknown event, whatever it is, uh, fire, EMS. Uh, when, when you're in the streets and arriving and, and responding to something you have not uh, been fully informed about, there are many, many dangers. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, anyway, I'm George Farinacci with the uh, Uniform Fire Officers Association. Um, our New York City population continues to grow. Uh, it's over 8.6 million people at this time. The population in New York City was barely over 8 million at the time of closing Engine Company 261 in 2003. That equates to a population increase of 5% uh, over the last 15 years. Um, Fire and emergency responses continue to, to increase. In 2018, we responded to 619,000 fires and emergencies, versus just five years before, in 2013, we responded to 479,000 fires and emergencies. A record set that year and has been broken each and every year following. Um, this has been nearly a 30% increase in responses to fires and emergencies in only five years. Uh, what's the impact of this increased population and response? Uh, we have decreased unit availability. 
We have an increase in the distances the units have to respond when the first two units are unavailable. Um, the increase in the time it takes to put water on a fire or mitigate your emergency. An increase in vehicle and pedestrian traffic throughout the city, the density that slows our fire trucks down. Uh, you may not be aware of it, but the lights and sirens on our fire trucks do not have a magical power of getting people and vehicles out of the way, responding. Uh, fire department units often have to sit in traffic uh, as, as we all do. The increase in fire department calls to fires and emergencies are far outpacing the booming population growth of New York City. The tremendous population growth of Long Island City, Astoria, Roosevelt Island, as well as the areas like Hudson Yards uh, development leaves the residents in need of more fire protection services, not less. By not expanding the available resources to meet the growing needs of the people, as well as the growing population, we are failing to maintain the status quo of services in our great city. Please reopen Engine Company 261, put a firehouse in the Hudson Yards, uh, the, uh, another increasing uh, area of development, and um, let's uh, take care of the people in New York City and provide the care and uh, protection services that they need. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, I'll let Orr. Sorry, Orr. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of uh, both the EMS locals, I would also like to extend our condolences and appreciation to our brothers and sisters on the other side of the aisle. We thank the committee for also being at the funeral this past week. My name is uh, Orrin Barzile. I'm the president of Local 2507 for the uniformed EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. Over the past decade, decade, Long Island City has experienced a drastic transformation, sprouting up residential towers that rival Manhattan and becoming the fastest growing neighborhood in the country. But unacceptably, its 911 response infrastructure has not grown with it. Currently, there are no pre preliminary dedicated EMS resources assigned to Long Island City. The closest brick and mortar facility is four miles away in Astoria and its backup facility is seven miles away in Woodside. The nearest available unit is stationed at Queens Boulevard and Greenpoint Avenue, with its backup positioned at Roosevelt Island Bridge. This response model was created early in 2000 when Long Island City was a collection of warehouses and a few private residence, residences. In 2017, the area along Vernon Boulevard alone saw a population increase of 6,700 residents. In 2018, it is estimated that the first 15,000 apartments will become available, resulting in a population increase of 80,000 residents. That population increase will be coupled with the arrival of an estimated 25,000 Amazon employees. In the face of this remarkable growth, the EMS response matrix has not been modified or enhanced. It has, as usual, been left in the rearview mirror. The current city population is at 8.5 million people. The FDNY EMS builds 828 ambulance tours per day, which yields to a ratio of one tour per 9,500 civilians. Therefore, at a minimum, at least 10 shifts would need to be added to the community to maintain the service level, which is currently at best essentially inadequate. To be clear, Amazon coming to New York will mean great things for, for investment and innovation for our great city. But we, might, we must plan responsibly for such significant changes. We need to keep our neighborhood safe and as well protected as the Upper East Side. We cannot keep leaving the emergency medical service out of these infrastructure conversations when the well-being of Long Island City residents is being jeopardized by the City of New York's Fire Department's current benign neglect. But as major development drive ahead with construction and job growth, bringing new community resources like schools, parks, and art facilities into Long Island City, the fire department re remains silent on how to address this demand for service. Across the city, EMTs and paramedics, who are currently facing a major personnel shortage, are doing more now with fewer resources than ever before imagined. 
The FDNY EMS has seen an increase in call volume every year for decades. And the currently unit availability, availability is at an all-time low. On a daily basis, the response matrix falls short of its targeted by nearly 60 shifts per day, which equates to 420 shifts per week, 1,800 shifts per month. We've seen this scenario play out in the newly gentrified areas of Williamsburg, Mauriciana, and Hudson Yards, where massive rapid growth has left resident, residents marginally protected, as those boroughs have the worst overall response times. The overall response time now hovers around 12 minutes mark, which ruminates of the 1970s. This infection of failing to field proper resources must not, be must not be allowed to spread to Long Island City. We cannot let the current system of chronic managerial indifference become the norm. This esteemed committee must ensure that the safety needs of our city don't continue to be overlooked as new neighborhoods arise. The fire department must be held responsible for planning and implementing the significant changes that are being mandated by exponential population growth and underfunding of the largest and busiest EMS system in the world. We need to keep our neighborhood safe and protective. Lives are at stake. Thank you for your time. Michael. <clears throat> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for letting us speak. Um, Amazon coming in is a good thing. Um, for EMS, it's a good thing because it gives us a chance to talk to you about the insufficient response times that EMS is currently under. I sat there and I listened to the department come in and basically dodge most of your questions. Um, either because A, best case scenario is they just didn't have it or B, because of sheer incompetence. Um, they talk about the TRG, the Tactical Response Group. Those two stations respond when call volume becomes too high in one area, jobs are holding 60, 50 jobs at a time, and then they get sent. It's already too late. Um, so the fact that they have 15 units running out, driving from Queens to Brooklyn to Manhattan to the Bronx, and I'll be honest with you, they very rarely are in Queens. Bronx every day is holding 60 to 70 jobs, so they are constantly redeployed to the Bronx. This is a citywide problem, not just an Astoria problem. Um, when we speak about opening up another firehouse, we are in agreement. Um, as an EMS union, I'm not going to sit here and say we don't need another firehouse. Astoria needs it. The fire department needs it. The UFA needs it. I'm here talking about what EMS needs as well. There is over 200 firehouses in New York City. We have only 30 EMS stations. That's three zero. So when my president talks about how it's a seven miles between stations, that response matrix that was made sometime in the early 80s and 90s is just not significant. I speak to the councilman who asked that $4 million is a drop in the bu bucket. EMS needs 50 drops in the bucket. We need $200 million. If you really want to protect Astoria, if you really want to protect the city, that's the sort of funding we need. And it's not just facilities, it's not just members, but it's pay as well. We have a service that we can't keep people because they're going to fire, they're going to sanitation, they're going everywhere else but being in EMS. That is a, a critical point to staffing and properly representing the citizens of New York. We talk about when it becomes necessary to add. It's, it's not becoming necessary, it's there. We are waiting, we are waiting for the resources, we're waiting for the funding, we're waiting for this administration to turn around and say, you know what, the emergency services, EMS, needs help. We are a system in crisis. If it's left up to this administration right now, people will die, and they are dying, because in our business, seconds count, and we are minutes away. A seven minute response time is terrible for a cardiac arrest. It's terrible. We talk about fires, we talk about getting water on the fire, and four minutes is an NFPA standard. There is no standard when it comes to EMS. We should be looking to get the same exact response times to a cardiac arrest that we are getting to fires. We applaud our fire department, we applaud firefighters because they sit there and they work and they know their job and they do it well and they're supported relatively well. They can always be supported better. But we are supported, it's non-existent. Right now, 
Our overtime rate is through the roof simply because we do not have the staffing. The acting uh, chief sat up here and said right now they're over par for their firefighters. We are drastically under par by hundreds and hundreds of members, paramedics and EMTs. So there is no cap on our overtime. Our answer is to sit there and work 16 hours. And then if you don't want to work 16 hours, chances are you're getting charges, which is a day AL or a day pay for refusing that mandation. So now you want to take that same matrix and put it into Astoria and just expect it to magically happen? I don't know how they expect to take care of 2,500 people, 25,000 people, just employees, when buildings are going up. They sat here and they said they have no met metrics for it. They need more data. 25,000 people are coming into Astoria. Can we adequately staff and protect those 25,000 people? The answer is no. They won't tell you it, but I will. The answer is no. Right now, with the seven stations that they're talking about in Queens alone, we only have seven. So they talk about 4-9 as, oh, well, you know, we're looking to expand 4-9. They're not telling you they're getting kicked out, that they don't want them there. The people who own the property say we need them out of there. So they're going to sit here and tell you that, oh, well, you know, we want to add more, more, more space. We want they're doing it because they have to. We have 100 people at a station minimum. We talk about bathrooms. God forbid you sat here and told the UFA president that the bathroom situation will be solved by you going to the bathroom in your closest bodega. Sit on a corner. Don't come back to the station to use the bathroom. Make sure you use the dirty hospital bathroom. Make sure you use the bodega. Go beg the 7-Eleven guy to use the bathroom. That is the conditions that we are facing every day. We are sat on a corner. And our response time is to go do the job. And we do more with less. We get sent from Astoria. Those units that they talk about that cover Astoria right now are getting sent to Brooklyn because the closest available unit is 20 minutes away. We go out of our area. The we don't know what a battalion is. So I thank you guys for having this hearing. I know it was directed towards the Astoria, but there is a grant. EMS is in crisis. So the Astoria just happened to shine the light, and right now the cockroaches are running, and we need your help to put the traps down. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just to address, I mean, this was about uh, Engine 261 per se, uh, but that's really only because the, the previous administration made the uh, bizarre decision to, to close a firehouse at the same time they rezoned to up the density. So, I mean, that, that you know, thankfully for all of us in the room, uh, that just highlighted the, uh, the misguided approach uh, at times of the, of the previous administration. Uh, but uh, finally, Vincent, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I didn't prepare a written speech, but I just wanted to make some points uh, I think that uh, Vice President Mike Greco already touched on. Uh, first, I want to say uh, I want to acknowledge uh, a hero that passed away, Firefighter Pollock. Uh, my condolences to his family and to the uh, fireside, and uh, thank you to the chairman and the members of the committee that showed up for the funeral. Um, what my uh, colleagues here have stated is, is absolutely correct. I understand this is a, a hearing for uh, to reopen Engine 261, which should never have been shut down from uh, day one. That was a mistake. Uh, fire protection is, is definitely needed. More firehouses are definitely needed. New York City, uh, number one, to address the um, traffic problems that exist, also because EMS is a very vertical city. It takes time to go up these high-rise buildings, so you need these buildings. Now that we're adding additional population, it's even more of a need. Um, but what always seems to be getting forgotten by the city is EMS. The population grows, and the EMS stations, they, they try to add additional units in the stations, pack them up like sardines, and we're bursting at the seams, but they never really add enough units to these neighborhoods. Um, as Vice President Mike Greco said, Station 49, they're being thrown out of there. The answer you heard was they're going to get a bigger station so they can add more units. They're not, that's not going to happen. The units they're relying on that are going to address the situation is the TRG that's in Queen, Queens. They call it Technical Response Group. And that group is already being used to answer the calls that are, are, are being held in Bronx, Brooklyn, and everywhere else in the city. We, the bottom line is we don't have enough ambulance stations. When we were taken over by the fire department, they said that we were going to get 70 stations. Well, it's 22 years later, and we're still at 30. We don't have enough station, and we certainly don't have enough personnel. In the last 12 months, we've lost 900 
EMTs and paramedics to the fire side, fire promotion. On a regular basis, we, we are down 40 to 50 ambulances daily that are going there simply because we don't have the staffing. That's the only reason why they're not being staffed. And that's just to cover the, the basic minimum staffing. We don't have the personnel that's needed on top of that in case of, like, you know, in case of somebody gets sick, we deal with sick people. That does happen. So people working are going to get sick. Vacations. We don't even think about that. That's not even thought of. Um, two areas I want to bring attention to. Staten Island, for example. And, and Councilman uh, Joe, Joe Borelli, you, uh, Chairman, you are, you, you're from that area. There's only two stations on all of Staten Island. I'm, ver I'm glad they got a new squad company there. I know they needed it. Uh, Staten Island has two stations, and all of Staten Island, 27 square miles, and there's only two stations, two EMS officers. You get one fire in Staten Island, the next unit's coming over to Brooklyn for EMS because we can't handle it. That means you've got to wait 30 to 40 minutes. You're in cardiac arrest, you're dead. There are people dying every single day right now, and it seems like n nobody cares to do anything about it. The resources just aren't being put there to, to help it. Brooklyn South, there's one station that covers Dyker Heights, Bensonhurst, Bay Ridge, and um, so, um, <laughs> my, this is my train of thought. Uh, Sunset Park, thank you. <laughs> and Sunset Park, one station in a small one, it's a refurbished firehouse, it could barely fit one ambulance inside the garage. That's one station for all those neighborhoods. That's what we're talking here. We are in crisis mode in EMS. There's no overtime cap, and I'm sure some people love it because they make it good money. They're making a decent salary, I should say, because the salary we earn $40,000 less than other emergency services. So I'm sure when the overtime cap is, is, is now gone, a lot of people are making a decent salary out of it. Um, but that's not a way, that's not the right way to run a uniformed emergency service. This is New York City. We're supposed to be the capital of the world, and this is how we're running an emergency service. Uh, um, those are just several points I wanted to make. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. I just have a, a question for, for Oren. Um, in your testimony, you said uh, you're talking about the city population, 8.5 million. Uh, there's 828 ambulance tours per day, which yields a ratio of one tour per 9,500 people. Is that, is that just the standard that we have, or is that a standard that the city is trying to maintain? Well, I'm sorry. There is no official standard. That's just what it averages out to. Okay. Um, and the second question for any, anyone that wants to ask, uh, answer it. Um, are, are there, and I'll, let me tell you why I'm concerned. Um, are there any voluntary ambulances that now service the Long Island City community? They were, that's the one unit they, went, they mentioned that they added. It's in Astoria, it's not in Long Island City. So if, if history is our guide, um, it's only a matter of time before that hospital pulls that service and then we're just short staffed so, so again. Uh, so if you look at my testimony in the back, I attached a few. Uh, a few rundowns so you can see where all the units are actually sitting. There's not one unit that covers that entire neighborhood. And are, are all five of you in agreement that, that population and density are what uh, are the primary factors in um, the number of uh, calls and the response time? So, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that neighborhood is so bad also that sometimes you have units from Brooklyn from Greenpoint, Brooklyn, covering Long Island City. But in, in, and in one of uh, the pages, if you look, there's a copy of uh, the station rundown for a paramedic unit. It's not even staffed. Mm -hmm. There's no people to cover. So even our backup resources are now depleted. And I just want to add about the voluntary units. Long Island City doesn't have a hospital. All right, so when a voluntary unit is going to come in and service an area, they try to bump out the FDMY units to cover where their hospital is because it's a cash gain for them. Um, if they're not bringing patients close to their hospital, they're not going to just staff uh, an area that's out of their own hospital. So whenever you start adding money, which money is a problem, 
I mean, if you gave me a magic wand, I would make FDNY not bill for services. This way, money taken out of the equation from where we respond to, who we respond to, we don't charge them per fire, we don't charge them per 911 call to get a police, but cash gets involved when it comes to EMS, which really does hurt response matrix and which areas get uh, ambulances. And if there was a study done to see who had the better insurance and which areas had the better population, I'm sure there'd be a problem to see their response time versus underserved areas and the uh, socioeconomic problems there. Uh, just to add to that, I mean, you kind of hinted towards it already. We can't rely on the privates or the voluntary hospitals, ambulance services, because when the profit's not there, they're gone. And we've seen it time and time again just recently with TransCare, 84 units gone overnight because they couldn't make the money or they were sold to a hedge fund or whatever it was, and they were gone. And once again, EMS had to pick up the slack. We had to pay unbelievable amounts of overtime to cover that area. And the people of the city ultimately is what who suffers. It's not just the members of EMS. It's not about just the members of EMS. It's the service we're trying to provide for the people of the city. And it, it, it hurts everyone. Um, so we can't rely on the voluntaries or the privates in that area. Uh, gentlemen, n next month there'll be a hearing on uh, EMS safety. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to ask you for some statistics on the insurance component. Uh, that if, if you want to just bring some, some fun facts. I mean, I'll, we'll save it for next week, but if you want to bring some uh, fun facts on it, uh, even in the sense of how we could get a better uh, understanding of uh, why some decisions might be made, uh, what to look out for, and then we could kind of look at it from our end, if that's okay. Um, a lot of it will be anecdotal because obviously the fire department in the city is not gonna let us access um, some of the records due to HIPAA violations and all that. So we all know the history of FOIA requests with this city. Um, it takes them a, a little while to get any information you ask for, but we can definitely bring some you know, information, or at least things to look for. Well, I have uh, two years, 300 and say 50 days left, uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll try. I just also want to add, uh, earlier last year you, ha you held a hearing about the budget, the FDNY budget, and we testified that the department did not put in a request for additional funding for EMS resources. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, finally, I think we have Josefina. Well, there she is. Josefina, please. Hi, my name is Josefina Sanfiliu. I founded Latinas Against FDNY Cuts, and I'd like to also add my condolences for Fice, firefighter Faisal Cotto, who was um, uh, killed apparently in a road rage incident. Um, he was, it was not line of duty. Now, my, uh, I have comments related to uh, the closings of 2003. The uh, FDNY at one time commissioned a study from Columbia University. It found that each engine company annually saves $15 million worth of property. Um, Acting Chief Sudnick mentioned, um, I think the cost of opening a fire company is $4 million. So it makes no sense um, to me the closing of any fire company on a budget basis. Now, 261 was closed in 2003. Also, Bloomberg closed engine 204, 278, which became the EMS station, which was just mentioned in Sunset Park. Uh, they also closed um, engine 209, which is, which is a shared house with a ladder company. And in Williamsburg, engine 212 and foam unit 91 and uh, engine 36 in Harlem. I mention them because it was not commented today that engine companies provide EMS services, including defibrillators. 
So if you cannot get sufficient ambulance services, when I'm having a heart attack in the subway someplace, you can, might be able to have an engine supplant that and keep me alive until the ambulance service shows up. Um, now, rezoning is, is apparently an issue of population compared to um, fire coverage, uh, uh, fire department coverage or emergency coverage. And I would ask to um, push for more data on rezoning and increased population in New York City as you were uh, able to get a squad company in Staten Island proving, proven by need of higher population in Staten Island or now in, in uh, Long Island City. Uh, Fourth Avenue is next to my house and there's, uh, it was rezoned for higher structures. Um, so I, I encourage the study of higher population compared to fire response. Now, in um, for the there's apparently slower response time. At the same time that New York City is is uh, pushing for pedestrian safety and having traffic slow down designs, and also the Citibank parking uh, is narrowing the lanes and could be related to slower fire department response time. Uh, and for the new response metrics are new to me and um, I don't know if those were published and they should have been published, that there's different measurement of how long somebody gets to a burning house with people inside. Uh, the other um, question is um, that a hollow building, the warehouse is going to be co comparatively like this, a hollow building, whether it has sprinklers or sufficiently or not, it's full of flammables. And the flammables are going to be toxic, released um, into the neighborhood. Um, I've seen uh, uh, incidents like that of uh, commercial places making it unbreathable for people in the area, um, poisoning people from the toxins, which are going to be um, different than a small house or a private apartment that's sealed off from uh, the quantity in a warehouse. Um, that's my comments for the day. Thank you very much. And I encourage the, I encourage the chair and the committee in the direction of getting answers uh, the, uh, more, that are not vague and to continue pushing for the safety of the citizens of New and residents of New York. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for testifying as always. And yes, of course we will. Anyone else interested in testifying? No. Nope. We're getting kicked out of the room anyway, so thank you very much.